Live, it's the Inside Scoop, Virginia. All the news Virginians want to know. Here's your host, political insider, George Burke. Welcome to Inside Scoop, Virginia. We have an uh, interesting show tonight. Uh, we are going to be talking about the Democratic National Convention, uh, which opens August 25th in Denver. It is the 45th Democratic National Convention. Uh, the presumed nominee, uh, Barack Obama, will be formally nominated on the last night. Uh, there will be four nights of speechifying and the like, and you will uh, uh, have an opportunity to watch some of it on television. We're hoping that uh, certainly on cable and on C-SPAN you'll pretty much see wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Uh, we'll see how much the networks actually provide. In the last couple of years they've only given about an hour. Uh, but we'll be talking about that as the show continues. Uh, right now, I'd like to introduce my guests for the evening. Uh, to my far right is Keith Lutman uh, from the Lee District of Fairfax County. He's a national delegate, pledged to Obama. Uh, Rachel Rifkind, she's from uh, the Mason District. She lives in Annandale. She's a uh, convention delegate, pledged to Hillary Clinton. Keith Scarborough from Prince William County. Uh, he is a delegate pledged to Obama, and Bruce Nielsen from Fairfax County from the Braddock District, and he is a delegate pledged to Clinton. At this point, you know, by the time we get through the convention, everybody will be an Obama delegate, and for all intents and purposes now, they are. Uh, let's just open it right up. Uh, it's going to be an exciting convention. I think it's going to be... Uh, one of the largest that we've seen. I think the interest uh, this time is higher. I've been to a whole bunch of Democratic conventions since 1980. I've been to every one except 1984. Uh, I was in the middle of a Senate campaign and could not uh, go to that one. Uh, but I think this is going to be the biggest. Uh, I think there's going to be thousands of additional people in the streets. Uh, I was looking at the, the host committee, the Denver host committees, uh, scheduled today and they have a number of other events taking place, some of them that will be open to the public. And then they're going to end up with uh, uh, the final night in the stadium in Denver where they expect to have 70,000 people. They say half of those tickets uh, will go to people from Colorado, two-thirds of them will be going to people in the Rocky Mountain West. So a lot of people from that area of the country, which is certainly an area that's changing slowly but surely from red to blue, uh, will have an opportunity to see Obama speak that night. So Keith, let's start right off the bat with you. Uh, uh, tell the viewers a little bit who you are. Tell us who you are and, and tell us uh, why you uh, took the long and arduous path to becoming a uh, Obama delegate. And it is a long and arduous path, uh, as we know. So uh, uh, tell us your story. Uh, well, I live in uh, Fairfax. Uh, I'm a software developer, and I started volunteering for Barack Obama within the week or so after he announced. Mm -hmm. And being a delegate was not anything that I'd even thought of. In fact, I'm new to politics. I've never gotten involved in any w ra way really before other than voting. And so I didn't even really know about the delegate process. I was just going out there and volunteering, trying to get him elected first, nom or getting him nominated on the primary ballot, all those steps. So it was really just a thing that started out very small. Um, as my mother likes to tell me, uh, you were just going to put out some information at a table in a farmer's market. And uh, next thing you know, I'm traveling to New Hampshire, both Carolinas, Pennsylvania for a few weekends. And then along with a few other folks um, here who were sort of the grassroots folks in uh, Ale the Alexandria area, we actually ran the primary get out the vote effort on Virginia's primary day. So it it started out very small, but once you get involved, you just kind of keep going. And I think all of that is what led up to me having um, some chance to be a national delegate. How did you first learn about the delegate process? Were, uh, did somebody coach you, urge you on, or is it just something you took upon yourself to do? It, it was more that other people suggested that, like, hey, have you thought about running for national delegate? I hadn't really thought of it. And there was a few other people who said, you should consider this. And I said, OK, I'll put my name out there, why not, and talk to the folks who knew how to do the appropriate paperwork and those sorts of things. And then at some point I got a call from someone in the governor's office saying, we'd like you to be on the slate that we're putting together. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, that's, that's really great. Thank you very much. And um, that was how, and that sort of you know, obviously helps a lot, but it's also never quite a guarantee. 
Um, but it sort of it boosts, gives you a little further boost, and that's how I got to that part of the delegate process. Well, as a relative newcomer to politics, you learn that nothing is certain in politics right. until it's over, <clears throat> whether it's an election, whether it's uh, going through the delegate selection process. Now, you were elected uh, as a delegate from the 8th Congressional District. My other guests were elected uh, in the 11th Congressional District. Uh, Rachel was elected uh, statewide. Uh, I'm familiar with this because I chair the 11th Congressional District Committee. But you had like a million people out there running for Obama delegates. So it's a, a credit to you that you were able to win. And, and it's also good to see that somebody who worked real hard in the grassroots level made the cut, so to speak. So welcome aboard. Rachel? I live in Fairfax County and in Mason District. I'm the chair of the Mason District Democratic Committee. Uh, I thought about being a delegate for a long time. And I, I knew that I was going to go to the convention. I had been to the last two conventions, but not as a delegate. And I knew that I, I I didn't, I didn't know the process, that I, how I was going to run, but I eventually wound up on a Clinton slate at, state, at the statewide level, which was an honor. And uh, again, I didn't know whether I was going to make it either at the last minute, but we did. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited about being a part of, of this process that is, is since 1964, Virginia is going to vote for a Democratic president. And I do recall you bought your plane ticket. Uh, I did. I bought my plane ticket in February and uh, about half of what it costs now to go. So it's uh, yeah, fortuitous. I don't, I don't think people realize that it's a relatively expensive uh, activity mm -hmm. to go to convention. Nobody pays your way. The party doesn't pay your way. Certainly the governor's office doesn't pay your way. The campaigns don't pay your way. You pay your own way to go, and on average, it costs the average delegate about three thousand dollars for the week when you get through the hotel rooms and the meals, and that's not even counting the booze bill. <laughs> Keith, um, Keith, you were also elected from the 11th. You were elected on a uh, Obama slate that ran in uh, the 11th district convention. Uh, both you and Rachel are members of the 11th district committee, and I'm very proud that you both. Uh, uh, are going to convention. Uh, talk a little bit about your activities leading up to your selection well, and election. I, I got involved uh, pretty early on with the Obama campaign. I've been involved in politics for 20 or 30 years and lots of campaigns at every level of government, but I had never really thought about going to a national convention. But uh, like a lot of people, I think my first real exposure to Barack Obama was the 2004 convention when he gave the keynote mm -hmm. speech. And then, uh, you know, I, I had the, the feeling then that this guy is going somewhere. And in, in 2007, he was the speaker at the state JJ dinner. And it was the, up until this year, that was the record uh, turnout that we ever had at a state JJ dinner. And you dinner. mean the Democratic Party of Virginia's annual Jefferson right. Jackson dinner? Right, Jefferson the Jackson largest dinner. fundraiser right. of the year, sorry. And so uh, right after that dinner, and uh, I guess about a year and a half ago now, uh, I contacted uh, friends who were working on the campaign and, and said, hey, I'd like to, to get involved. And then I uh, was recruited to, to uh, do the petition process for the 11th Congressional District and uh, uh, did that, uh, you know, got the, the signatures that we needed all over the state to uh, get Obama on the ballot and then uh, decided, hey, I the, this is the year to be at, the, at a national convention. So, uh, you know, with your help and, and the help of others, uh, got uh, fortunately on the Obama slate and, and was elected at the 11th District Convention. And uh, it's, it's really an historic opportunity to be able to, to go to a national convention this year. It's no doubt. It's historic in many ways, not the least that we have uh, an African-American, although my wife, who's been an Obama supporter since day one, keeps saying he's not, he's white. You know, he's half and half. He <laughs> might as well be white if he is black. What difference right. does it make? Let me also put a plug, since I'm a, I'm a fellow Midwesterner, he, you know, he's born in Kansas, or, you know, his, his mother is in Kansas. So, uh, you know, he has, he has the, those great Midwestern values that, uh, that we need in the White House. Bruce? Bruce is from, as I said, Braddock. He's uh, the treasurer, longtime treasurer of the Fairfax County Democratic Committee. And uh, uh, tell your story. Well, uh, this year in May, I retired from the federal government. Uh, prior to that, there was a lot of uh, concern, a lot of hesitation with the administration that's in town and with uh, political uh, activity in all levels of government and administration. But uh, 
when I made my decision to retire in May, I decided also that I was going to make a serious run for this. My wife, Kathy Nielsen, was a delegate for Bill Clinton in 1996 hey. at the Chicago Convention. Uh, we attended as uh, members of the party, but not uh, delegates. My wife was on the platform committee in the year 2000 for Al Gore's convention. In 2004, we worked hard to get two of our personal friends elected that could go and attend the uh, Boston Convention. So in my household, there's been uh, convention interest uh, for many, many years. I have uh, 14 or 15 years of volunteer experience with the Democratic Party, and having been a federal employee, uh, I had to uh, keep a lower profile, but with retirement and no more dependency on the feds for my salary. I thought this was the year to go for it. Two years ago, my niece served as a uh, summer intern while she was in graduate school in public administration with the Hillary for Senate campaign. The last, uh, her last Senate race was in 06. Uh, we were convinced even then that Hillary was running for president and I was an early supporter of Hillary's and her uh, campaign effort, including uh, sending other uh, interested people to get in touch with campaign management folks in the campaign and uh, certainly activities out of uh, D.C. when the office was there and then later in Arlington. So I have a long involvement and my wife more than me even with the uh, uh, Clintons as uh, leaders of the Democratic Party and I'm um, just as excited as anybody from the Obama uh, organization that will all be there in Denver in a couple weeks. So you'll definitely be there Tuesday night cheering on when Hillary Clinton, when it's Hillary Clinton's night at the convention. I wouldn't miss it. I think that uh, uh, the Obama campaign has worked very hard, and I think the Clinton campaign has uh, worked in tandem in terms of making sure that this is going to be a memorable convention. And uh, making sure that when everybody walks out of Denver, <coughs> that Thursday night, for all the most people who leave Friday and Saturday, uh, the 29th and 30th, uh, that our party will be more unified than ever uh, and prepared to take over the reins of government the following January after we win the November election. The, uh, uh, when we return, I want to talk a little bit about the, <clears throat> the passion that these candidates have instilled in, in, in people who are delegates. And I want to talk a little bit about what you expect out there. Now, Bruce and Rachel have been there before, so they sort of have a feel uh, for this. Uh, uh, but it's interesting sometimes how folks going for the first time, what they do expect and what, in fact, occurs. Uh, I want to remind our viewers that our phone lines are open at 571-749-1166. Uh, uh, we invite you to call. Uh, if all goes well, we may have a remote a little bit later to a, a different location and talk to Shannon Sullivan over there. Uh, I thank you for watching and uh, urge you to continue. We'll be back in two minutes. So stay tuned and we'll see you around. Some dreams are universal. Dreams that inspire us. Multiple sclerosis is a devastating disease that changes lives forever. The National MS Society does more for people with MS than any organization in the world. But we can't do it alone. To get involved, visit us online at nationalmssociety.org or call 1-800-FIGHT-MS. This is why we're here. Because nobody dreams of having multiple sclerosis. What's wrong with this picture? Half of young Americans can't locate economic powers like Japan and India. 20% can't even find the Pacific Ocean. Without geography, our children aren't ready for the world. Geography is everywhere. It's incredible creatures. Rhythm. 
fashion, flavor. It's economics and politics. It's change. Understanding connections between people and places is critical in the 21st century. That's why we created MyWonderfulWorld.org. Go there now for your free parent and teacher action kits and give our kids the power of global knowledge. Because kids who understand our world today can succeed in it tomorrow. Yeah, I thought you were going to get your glasses. Once again, George Burke with the Inside Scoop, Virginia. Welcome back. We're talking about the upcoming Democratic National Convention. Uh, I think it's going to be an exciting event. It's going to be a historic event. Uh, we have uh, four national delegates from Virginia, four of, I think it's about 104, or somewhere in that range, delegates who are coming from Virginia from across the length and breadth of the Commonwealth. Uh, we have Keith Lutman, Rachel Rifkind, Keith Scarborough, and Bruce Nielsen. They'll all be part of the Virginia delegation sitting on the floor for the four nights uh, from August 25th to August 28th when the Democrats meet in Denver. Uh, you know, I've already heard tales from some friends of mine who are doing preparation work and the like. They're going to be shoehorning you folks into that Pepsi Center. Uh, the, uh, it's, you know, it's a big venue, but uh, they're not quite sure it's big enough to, to fit everybody. When I say everybody, I think they have 15,000 credentialed media. That's the one biggest group that comes, 15,000 members of the media, and some of them will not be happy campers when they move them a couple of miles down the road and put them in the Colorado Convention Center. But what people don't realize is delegates have a special place at the convention. They have seats uh, on the floor uh, for the four nights, <coughs> guaranteed credentials, etc. <coughs> you then have all these hangers-ons. You have other party officials who get credentials of anything from honored guests to floor passes and sometimes even a handful of podium passes. And then you have the media and, and the vendors and stuff. But media is huge, 15,000 of them. But I would suggest that two-thirds of them or more never make it to the floor of the convention center. There are many of them who never see the floor of the convention center other than on television. And uh, even with a lot of the big names in the press corps, they are, ca are in galleries that are in the basement or off-site or next door to the convention center. And they have somebody from the DNC who runs their press gallery. And they come in and they sign on to lists. And they may get 45 minutes on the floor, an hour on the floor, 30 minutes on the floor, depending on who the uh, what gallery it is, and they sign out the pass, and if they're not back within that appointed time so the next person can get that pass, they don't get to go down on the floor again. So there's a lot of incentive to do it right. So it's a huge group of people. I think that there's uh, 17,000 hotel rooms have been rented in Denver for this thing. And uh, it's... Uh, uh, the, it's just the whole, it's going to envelop the whole downtown of Denver. Uh, they put, they've got some new light rail and transit systems that they're going to put in place and what they have running now. Uh, they're running shuttles, they're doing everything possible, but I wouldn't, if I lived in Denver, I wouldn't be, my sister-in-law lives there. She says, I don't think I'll be driving downtown that week. They have had a lot of public relations uh, campaign going on for the people who live in Denver, that this is mm -hmm. going to be just fine and, and uh, be patient. Well, I, th I thought it was interesting that the city of Denver has actually, I think, done a pretty good job of selling their city. Yeah. They, when you get onto the, the host committee's website, they have a whole section for the media. They give you B-roll, uh, history of the city, and all this stuff. You know, they're using it to full advantage. I mean, every city does, but you know, when you have a convention in New York, it's not quite the same thing as, as Denver having it. New York convention is, while it's big, it's still just another event of a number of events taking place in the city. When it's in Denver, which I think has the 10th largest downtown 
uh, in the United States in terms of office space and all this stuff. Uh, it's a much, much bigger deal, and it, it's sort of all-encompassing for the city that week. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, um, Keith, you're a first-timer. I mean, what, tell me what you expect. Tell me how you envision the convention. Well, you know, the delegates from the 8th District, we met with some folks who have been to these conventions before, and they showed us their souvenirs and kind of gave us the, a general outline of what happens. And so my expectation is that it's a lot of meetings, it's a lot of workshops, it's a lot of connecting with other people who are obviously working very hard for the candidate. And I think that's going to enable us to help each other out once we get back uh, to our respective homes and away from Denver. I've also heard it's a lot of parties and fun. But one of the things that um, I was really excited about that I heard about on a radio show, and I haven't looked it up to confirm it, but I'm assuming they wouldn't make this up because it's a pretty reliable show, is that they are planning the night of, the, of his acceptance speech to turn that whole gathering of people into a giant phone bank and have everybody in there make, you know, I don't know, 10 or a dozen calls or something like that to voters while they're sitting in the stadium, you know, doing nothing for several hours waiting for it to happen. And I thought, well, how amazing is that? You know, if each person makes about a dozen phone calls, there's a million voters that'll be contacted just that one night from Denver. And I just thought, what, what a great use of that time. What a great use of that enthusiasm. And even better is that it sends all those people back home with an experience of having done a little phone banking. I mean, I'm somebody who I never would have thought, like, I'm not a salesperson. I would have thought I would have hated phone banks. I run phone banks now. I love them. They're a lot of fun. And you're talking to just regular people. And you know, we tell people the, the uh, less practiced, less uh, smooth you sound, the better. Because you don't sound like a professional telemarketer. When you're talking to a voter on the other end of the line, you sound like just a normal person like them. And so I think to give 60, 70,000 people that same experience is going to turn them into phone bankers when they go back home and they're going to tell their friends how easy it is. And so it's a really exciting and very smart use of that time to just keep building, keep building the movement and make sure that we win. And there'll be a lot of people in that uh, stadium who really aren't particularly political. They're just going because they want to see Obama. They want to get a gander of him, as many people want to do. And uh, they'll have an opportunity that night. Very innovative. I, one thing I'm I'm looking forward to is just the uh, the the amount of, of uh, media coverage and and uh, this this whole presidential campaign has been really the first one where both where all the candidates have taken advantage of the of the internet and uh, and every other kind of uh, media that's available and bloggers are going to be there a large number of bloggers and so I. You know, I, the, the major media, I think, are making a huge mistake. They're going to limit their coverage to maybe one or two hours a night. Well, the networks. The, the networks cable, do that. Cable right. and yeah. MSNBC but and C-SPAN. Right. Give it but the, you know, the, 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 ma the cable outlets, the bloggers, uh, the, all the Internet outlets, it's going to be more of an open convention for more people to see gavel to gavel through various kinds of media than has ever been possible before. And I think the... The, the, that's one of the things that, that was so exciting about the primary campaign for both for both Obama and Hillary was that you know they ex they created so much buzz online about their candidates and uh, they've continued to raise huge sums of money online and so you know the, the traditional coverage of, uh, of a convention with the, the major networks is is almost superfluous <coughs> I think most people are good whatever coverage they see of the convention is going to come through something other than the the four major broadcast networks. Something else that uh, impressed me about the night that Obama gives his acceptance speech, which is going to be Thursday, August 28th, um, we were asked by the Obama campaign to assist in this effort, but I found out that it's been uh, already going online through the Obama website for some time. And this is for folks that will not be attending in Denver, but people that would like to watch at home on, on uh, the night of the acceptance speech, we've been asked as party uh, activists to help identify hosts for house parties so that in, in these house parties in local neighborhoods, uh, people who are friends and people who are uh, neighbors can all get together for house parties to watch the acceptance speech. This is going to be another touch on, uh, Keith, what you mentioned about the phone banking. Uh, this is another way to extend the reach of the uh, Obama message to as many uh, people as possible and 
they're making this possible through the internet without having to depend on network television or having to depend on mainstream media uh, to extend their message. So I was very impressed with that. I went right home and I found uh, two party hosts for them and got them in touch with the campaign. The one thing that I'm excited about is, and, and every time I go into the Obama campaign office or, or even the coordinated campaign office, is there's so many people that I have not seen before. This is bringing a whole new level of excitement to this, to this campaign with new people, and it's, it's not the same people that we see day in, day out. And, and I, I think that's going to have a big impact. I think what we're hearing in the background are some of the uh, folks who are gathered at the Sign of the Whale. We are uh, going to try something tonight after the break, uh, and that is to go to a remote location uh, where Shannon Sullivan is with uh, a few folks, and, and she'll probably show up on the screen. This is the first time we're doing this, so uh, we don't quite know if it's going to work or not. We're using the powers of the internet to transmit it, but the real purpose of doing it is uh, during the convention, I'll anchor a show here, and we'll have Mark Levine with a crew out in Denver, and we're going to try and accomplish the same thing, whether uh, we do something from the hotel where the Virginia delegation is, or whether we try to do something from the floor, what people don't understand, and we'll all see it even when uh, uh, Shannon tries to talk to us from this bar with all these people talking in the background and stuff, is it's very tough to report from the floor of the convention. In the old days, you know, you were talking about how the media is different. In the old days, if a Dan Rather came through the floor, he'd have his little antenna on his head and there'd be a little camera crew with him and everybody would be gaga over the fact that he was walking across the floor. Well, the network correspondents who are going to be walking across the floor now from CBS, NBC, and ABC, most people won't even know who they are because they don't have the same reach they used to have because of all this other stuff. <coughs> we're coming to the break again. As I said, after the break, at some point, we're going to try and do a, uh, a remote uh, uh, deal from uh, the Sign of the Whale in Falls Church to see if it works. If it doesn't, I'll apologize in advance. This is new technology using new equipment we have, and uh, hopefully it will. So thank you for watching. Uh, we have another half an hour, and uh, we look forward to your continued interest, and see you after the break. This year, 28,000 Americans will be diagnosed with oral cancer. Every year, 7,000 Americans die of oral cancer. I'm Eva Cohen, and I'm an oral cancer survivor. I didn't fit the profile. I didn't smoke or drink. I had no family history of cancer. No family history of cancer. I was 31 years old. 31 years old. I went to see my dentist about a sore in my mouth that wouldn't heal. It was oral cancer. I had to have a radical neck dissection and a portion of my tongue reconstructed. I didn't know if I was going to live or die. I'm Surgeon General Richard Carmona. The survival rate for oral cancer is only 50%. Oral cancer can happen to anyone. If you have a sore or lesion in your mouth that doesn't heal within two weeks, see your dentist. Early detection is the key. Early detection saves lives. I know. One in eight Americans goes hungry. One idea helped change that. A community started a garden that blossomed into farmer's markets. One in six children lives in poverty. One group of women found an answer by opening a daycare center that their neighbors could afford. Today, 36 million Americans live in poverty. But one by one, people are helping themselves and each other to change the picture of poverty to one of hope. For easy ways you can help, visit PovertyUSA.org. words for you. Pop quiz. Ready? Name any funny movie. A drama. Name a mystery. And one more thing. Name the movie your kids saw today in science class. Know what really matters. Know about your kid's school and know about your kid. Find out 100 ways to know more, do more. Live. It's the inside Live. It Live. It Welcome back. A few convention facts for you. 
Approximate number of hotel rooms booked in Denver, 17,000. Number of countries represented by journalists attending and covering the convention, 130. Number of people who've signed up to volunteer at the convention, 21,000. Just gives you an idea of the magnitude of the numbers. So, what do you expect at the convention? You've been there before. What do I expect? Um, actually, I expect a uh, week of festivities that show a unified Democratic Party, a party that's determined to win in November, a party that's ready to lead in January. We've had eight years of uh, Republican administrations, which many people believe have left this country in a sad state. And the best choice for change is the Democratic Party, and that's going to be from the president right down to local congressmen, senators. Uh, some states are electing governors this year. I expect a tidal wave of uh, votes for Democrats this year, and I expect a sea change in how this country is managed, how it's run, and uh, how people are treated as taxpayers, citizens, and members of our community. And we expect to win Virginia for the first time since 1964 when LBJ won Virginia. The, uh, what about you, Rachel? You've been there before. This will be your first time as a delegate, and I know how much you wanted to be a delegate and how hard you worked. What do you think? Gosh, I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to be in the delegation on the floor uh, when the first speech comes is, is going to be so exciting that, that we're just we're going to we're going to be beyond ourselves. I mean, it's just, it's it's unbelievable the, the anticipation. Um, I know that that when I was there in, in the last convention when Obama spoke too, I, I turned to a friend of mine. We were sitting way up in the rafters uh, on a credential that we got from George. Um, <laughs> uh, and we both looked at each other when Obama finished speaking and said, there's our next president. And this was before we had any real idea that Hillary might run. But he had such an impression, left such an impression on me. Um, and I expect to see even more of that this week. That, that well, week. I just received word that we are ready to switch to our remote location at the sign of the whale. Uh, Shannon Sullivan, who some of you may know is, uh, 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 is going to do some hosting on this show, is also an Obama delegate to the convention. So if the technology allows, here we are looking at uh, the sign of the whale. Shannon, good to see you there. He's it's about to go live. And they're coming to us right now? Second. <laughs> Hi there, George. This is Shannon from the Sign of, Sign of the Well, and I have with me Alec, our, who is our restaurant owner and bartender. I'm the host uh, tonight. Oh, the host of the Sign of the Well. <laughs> all right. Um, Alec has a personal convention experience, which he'd like to share with all of our guests. And we have also gotten some questions from the bar that have been passed down to us, which we'll uh, ask Alec and some of our guests in the, uh, in the studio. Alec, you were at the 1996 convention. It's uh, better known as the Dick Morris Convention. For anyone familiar with that fiasco that took place, but conventions are fantastic events to be at. The energy you see in a convention, and I certainly hope Denver does the same thing Chicago did in 1996 and that they don't strictly enforce the uh, late night rule when bars should close. So it's, it's, it's great because during the day you hear so many wonderful speakers. You're so energized about the platform. You're energized about the direction of the party and the direction that the country can go. And then at night everybody comes together and uh, while not giving away any details, the parties are <laughs> wonderful. And that's where you really come together and it's nice and uh, you leave the part, you leave the convention with basically uh, you're very energized and you're very hungover in most cases. Well, I do think that one of the themes of the Democratic Convention this year is inclusion, that we're trying to build party unity, especially between all the Obama and the Hillary supporters, and that uh, whether that happens on the convention floor or after hours, uh, it's not me to judge. 
Um, you mentioned the 1996, sorry, 1996 convention, also the 1964 convention. Um, there was a lot that happened in uh, 64, especially with all of the protests, that we may or may not see a reoccurrence. I don't know if you want to comment on any of the recent judge rulings that have kind of gated off and tinted the potential protesters and whether you think that's an infringement on their uh, freedom of speech. It would be a, an infringement on their freedom of speech, but what I understand is now they've been, uh, the protesters at the convention have been labeled illegal combatants oh, by the current administration. No, so right. so they're allowed to be treated as if they're in Guantanamo Bay and they stripped from all their rights that they have. I think it's not a good idea to, to take away people's rights, constitutional rights of free speech. If they want to protest, that's part of what this country stands for, and that's one of the things that make this country great is the protesting and everybody has their voice heard. So I think the idea of caging the protesters in small areas far from the convention uh, location is not a good move to show the world what our democracy stands for. Yeah, I, I can't be in but more agreement there. I hope that, you know, whatever the cause is, that that makes the airwaves, whether it gets to the convention floor, gets across to the delegates, which I think is each of the protesters' original intent, but that we don't have any uh, flogging or, uh, you know, mass riots that have to end up, you know, getting people detained. Um, you were also talking about the type of energy that the Democratic Party is trying to build, and the, right now the Obama campaign is trying to set a record by uh, having the final acceptance speech on Thursday night of the convention, the final night at Invesco Field, which is going to hold uh, 76,000 people. Um, and that's uh, mainly going to be delegates, the alternates, and also have a large contingent of the public. Do you think that there's any major gaffe that Obama can do here, or if he potentially uh, is just going to blow the socks off of everyone and set political history? I think if he asked Paris Hilton or Britney Spears to introduce him at that speech, might be considered a gaffe. Other than that, he'd have a hard time I blowing it there. I think that Paris Hilton is making a strong campaign, whether it's for potentially a presidential bid or a vice presidential pick. Um, maybe you have uh, some insight on vice presidential uh, nominees. Well, I think it's interesting that the John McCain campaign tried to pick the dumbest bimbo they could find to have a debate with, and now, after this week, the bimbo's winning the debate. She's asking, what's John McCain going to do now? Okay, how's he going to deal with world leaders when he can't beat Paris Hilton in a debate? So when you're matching wits with Paris Hilton and you lose, I think the voters need to take that into consideration. But also keep in mind, I love the idea of taking the speech to Invesco Field because that's what the Democrats stand for is inclusion, bringing people in. Uh, all the people that can make that speech, all of the people, uh, uh, the working class, the drinking class, which we see at the whale, all of them welcome to come in and be part of this uh, wonderful campaign, uh, this uh, fantastic movement that's taking place behind Barack Obama, and to have that many people to be able to share in that, I think it's an awesome move on uh, Barack Obama's part. All right, I think as we're wrapping up here, and we're going to head back shortly to George in the studio with the rest of our Obama and Clinton delegates, we did have one question from the bar, um, mainly hinging on the age differential between a lot of the new Obama delegates and even the Clinton ones that are emerging in our political um, spectrum, and specifically the use of bloggers and new technology. Um, the Democratic Party has credentialed bloggers from every state and territory and is setting them actually in the different delegate seats and allowing them uh, unprecedented coverage. So when you get a chance, George, in the studio, I'd like you know, a little bit of your input, and especially from the delegates, how you feel uh, you know, bloggers will add or subtract from uh, the coverage of the convention. And that's uh, Shannon from the Sign of the Well with Alec. Thank you very much, Shannon. All right, back to you, George. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, we know the technology works, so that's uh, great news right there. Um, and uh, we will uh, uh, hopefully be using this when uh, some of our people are in Denver in a couple of weeks at the convention. Uh, the question that was posed at the end was the fact that the Democratic National Committee is embedding bloggers uh, in all the delegations. Uh, I think we all have our own thoughts. I've heard from some delegates who think it's a good idea. I've heard some delegates think it's a bad idea. I'm not particularly enamored by the idea myself, although there are, there is at least one delegate who is a blogger who was elected as a delegate. From That's Virginia? From Virginia, mm -hmm. yes. Vivian Page will be okay. a, is a delegate, and uh, she's from the Hampton Roads area. 
uh, and she's also a well-known blogger in Virginia. Uh, I know that some of the mainstream media, some folks at the Post and elsewhere, their noses are out of joint because they said, well, you know, if you embed the press with the, the delegation, why are you in, embedding bloggers? And uh, so we'll see how it works. I'm not sure that it'll be good or bad. We really don't know until it happens. So I guess we'll see. What are the thoughts of the panel on that? I'm not particularly happy with it. Um, from what I understand, uh, the bloggers have the right to say anything, write anything, without regard to who they're writing about and what they're saying. And I, I don't really like the idea of being on guard. And that, that aspect of it bothers me. And you'll have to watch yourself at the parties, I guess. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, it's not I, like having a gossip columnist <laughs> with you. Right. Well, I, I think as long as everyone understands who, you know, the, that they're there and that this, they bring one perspective, but, you know, they are one perspective. And I, I, I agree that I, I think it may, be, it may have sort of an, uh, a chilling effect in, in some ways because if, if you're going to be concerned about what, you know, a comment you make shows up on a blog the next day, you may not be as forthcoming about uh, about things, but uh, I, I think as everyone, as long as everyone, all the delegates uh, understand who the bloggers are and what the ground rules are, then uh, you know I, I think it's it's uh, it's an experiment that's probably worth making. Do we know the ground rules? <laughs> you know, people often wear funny hats at, at conventions. My philosophy <laughs> is they require the bloggers right. to wear the funny hats this time, so right. you know who they are. <laughs> right. Well, I, I mean, seriously, I mean, I, as, as a convent, you know, as a delegate, I, I would, I would want to know. I, I would think that uh, once we get to Denver, when we have our first meeting, that that someone from the party explains, here's the deal. Uh, there are bloggers. Here's who they are. You know, deal with them as as you're comfortable, but just be aware that there there are bloggers that are that are among us, and and you know, just deal with them as you choose but I think it's you know we should all be uh, you know be able to know who they are and and at least have our, our own ability to deal with them that way yeah I, I think Rachel's point is exactly probably the most important one which is that you just want to know that someone is interviewing you or taping what you're saying or writing down what you're saying I, I think we've become used to bloggers as being sort of part of the mix and you sort of take them with however much how many grains of salt you want to take them but the the part we don't really like is when we don't know that it's happening. And I can tell you, we had this, as having uh, been a, a small victim of that myself, we had this great, uh, we had an Iowa watch party um, the night of the Iowa caucuses. And there's hundreds of people there at a place in Arlington. And uh, the next day, one of my friends points out to me that there is possibly the worst picture you could find of me with a snarky caption on Wong Cat. And I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that they were even there. And, and it's a public venue, people can you know, do whatever they want to, but you just, like you say, you don't think that you're on like all the time. And I don't know, do we have to get used to being on all the time? Um, well, I... Uh, you got 20, 25 view. seconds, and we gotta <laughs> cut you off for the break, but go ahead. Sure. Uh, little democracy is a good thing. Uh, I'm not sure a lot of democracy is a better thing. <laughs> uh, the blogs are here. They're here to stay. The internet is a great empowering <coughs> tool and one that has opened up the uh, political process to millions more voters and uh, many of them uh, partial democratic voters. So I'm just fine with it. Well, we'll see how it works. Uh, you know, certainly I'm glad that they're covering the convention. Uh, if I was a delegate, I figure you can always kick them out of the delegation if you have to, huh? But anyway, we're going to take a break, and then we'll be back. My guests uh, will be here for the next 15 minutes. See you then. One just books at the library. Hello. You have a lot of great books here today. You know there's more than just books at the library. 
I know. There's more than just books at the library. I don't want to be hooked to a machine. I want all the medical treatment available to me. I wouldn't want my family to have to make this decision. My doctor knows what's best for me. An advanced directive is your life on your terms. Talk with your family. Decide what's right for you. Then put it in writing. Documenting my wishes today means my family won't have to make heart-wrenching decisions later. To learn more, visit www.putitinwriting.org. 1,200 American youth run away from their homes every day. The National Runaway Switchboard is here to help. 1-800-RUNAWAY. If you are a runaway, thinking about running away from home, or a parent or guardian concerned about issues facing your child, call us 24 hours a day. 1-800-RUNAWAY. In times of crisis, hope is just a phone call away. 1-800-RUNAWAY. Once again, George Burke with the Inside Scoop, Virginia. Welcome back to Inside Scoop, Virginia. A few more convention statistics. The first Democratic convention was held in 1832 in Baltimore, Maryland. First nominee was Andrew Jackson. The number of years since Denver last hosted the Democratic National Convention, 100 years. Uh, the presidential nominee at the Democratic Convention in 1908 was Williams Jennings Bryan. He didn't win, so let's hope <laughs> that's not a precursor for the future. Uh, the largest delegation is California with 503. The smallest is American Samoa with 13. Uh, the Guam delegation will travel the farthest to attend the convention in Denver. Uh, they'll be traveling for at least 22 hours. Uh, the delegates will be uh, a mile high, so I want to forewarn them ahead of time, watch your booze intake because it will have much more of an impact <laughs> on you. Uh, you'll also find that walking a mile feels like you're walking two miles. I spend a lot of time at that altitude and higher, and believe me, it's, it, it does make a difference. Uh, the Pepsi Center, which will be the main venue for the uh, first three days of the convention and some of the pre convention activities, etc., is built on 45 acres. Um, I think it's interesting that the media will actually have more square footage. Uh, the, the Pepsi Center Convention Operations uh, has 675,000 square <coughs> feet. Uh, the media pavilion gets another 200,000 square feet just for the media. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major, major undertaking. The party's been working on this thing for two years to get it ready. It literally takes two years. And uh, uh, as I said, it's going to be a show. One of the things that I think is very interesting, some of the pundits have suggested that uh, it was hard on the party to have a primary that, that ran as long as it did. Uh, I'm of a different uh, viewpoint myself. I think that it sharpened everybody. I think it got a lot of people motivated. And I think a lot of the activity we are seeing taking place now is a direct result that people remained active and had to remain active and had to stay on their toes for their respective candidates throughout the spring when normally this is decided as early as February or March. Uh, I mean, it literally wasn't decided till about six weeks ago. So, uh, I mean, what are your thoughts? I mean, it's a different campaign this time. I mean, the level of activity taking place not only now for Obama, uh, but for Mark Warner and for the congressional candidates is, is amazing. It's, it's, it's August. This primary, uh, different than any other presidential primary I've participated within uh, in the last 16 years, the last four, uh, this primary, more than any of those others, has brought an energy level to the Democratic Party that I've never seen. I agree with you. I was so amazed when John Kerry was running for president, and my choice for uh, in, with, throughout the primaries was someone else. Uh, the Kerry campaign was very gracious to absorb those that advocated others uh, once it was settled that Kerry would be the nominee, but that was settled in February. That was settled before Virginia even had its vote. Uh, this year, 
uh, all the primary contests were held, all the votes were held, and that stretched out into June. Um, the new people that have been recruited to, there were, there were eight choices in the early primaries uh, until some of them started dropping off. There were eight organizations built. There were eight small businesses that rose, and seven of which have fallen. Uh, one that remains is not a small business anymore, but a big business. But that business is politics, it's democratic politics, and we're all aboard. Uh, Rachel, you commented on new faces in the office. I was just amazed the last time I went in the Obama for America office and saw two people I knew, but about 30 I had never seen before. I was there the other day myself, and it was the same thing. And uh, I saw a couple of folks from Fairfax County Democratic Committee, and I saw the guy who's running the office, uh, Lucas. Uh, but everybody else were new faces, and right. I think that's very exciting. And in the FCDC, the Fairfax County Democratic Committee office, we have got all these interns that have come and want to work, and one elected a Democrat this time. And, and it's exciting to see them, and they're, and they're, but they're all going off to college in September, so we're yeah. going to have a whole new right. crew of interns come in. At least four out of five of us at this table have been involved in politics for a long time. And it's rather disarming when you walk into the Obama office and the folks at the front desk, and they're not kids, they're, you know, they're adults, look at you like, who are you? Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there, and there are a couple of other things that I, that I think in the long run, having gone through the primary process, will, will help Barack Obama. Uh, you know, Barack Obama campaigned in every state in the union. He campaigned in Nebraska. He campaigned in North Dakota. He set up operations, he had to, running against Hillary in every state. Those organizations are ongoing. In Virginia, we were, or we were you know, uh, involved much earlier, and the Virginia primary meant something for a change. So it's given him the opportunity, he had the forced opportunity, to build a network and start doing it early as opposed to after the convention. The other thing is, uh, I mean, I, I can't think of, of any more formidable candidate to run against than Hillary Clinton. And the fact that Barack Obama, you know, uh, uh, came through the primary and convention process, he's a much stronger candidate having run against Hillary Clinton than he would have been otherwise. And I think that prepares him for the general election. Well, I mean, it's the same thing if you look at it in a microcosm here in the 11th district. We had a hard fought primary in the 11th. And, uh, you know, I mean, at the end, end result, we had a candidate. We had two good candidates. Well, we had four good candidates running, but we had two who were clearly had that front runner status. Uh, one of them won, one of them didn't. That's how the game is played. Uh, but, you know, we've seen people coalesce, and we've seen, uh, we've seen a lot of energy coming out of that campaign now. And, and there's certainly, you know, I walk into the Connolly headquarters, and there's a number of people in there who I would have seen and during the primary and the burn headquarters. It's just the nature of the beast. Democrats come together after these primaries. Uh, people looking from the outside may think they're rather hard fought, et cetera. Uh, some of us who've been in a lot of them, you sort of get a tough skin or thick skin, and you go through the process, and then you move on. Back to what Keith was saying about Obama having to, to campaign in every state. Um, I don't recall having as many offices for the presidential candidate in, a, in Virginia ever. And it's been, a, it's been a constant battle for Virginia Democrats to get materials and uh, to get, to get the, the, the candidate here. And I think he's been here twice, three times. His wife has been in, in Norfolk. Um, and Richmond. It, and, and Richmond. Mm -hmm. um, well, let me, let me know, put Obama a, did his town meeting in Fairfax. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, uh, from Robinson High School. Three weeks ago at yeah. Robinson. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and let, let me put in a personal plug for Prince William County. Uh, you know, uh, the, the week after the convention, or the, the primary process was over, Obama did two appearances in Virginia, one in Bristol down in, in Southwest, and the second was in Nissan Pavilion. Which is in the, in, in, in Prince, Prince William, William County. And, and I can tell you that... Uh, you know, we, we had, had our office opening, and there were 200 people there for opening a campaign office in Prince William. And, uh, you know, the people, Virginia has never seen this kind of campaign in a presidential race before. And so it, it's energized people. Uh, you know, we were, in, in terms of volunteers, we're now in August where most campaigns are in September, October, in terms of the interest of, of volunteers. So 
uh, Virginia clearly is a battleground state, and, and uh, you know, and Obama has made a very serious commitment to give us all the infrastructure we need. Well, well George, you know, as somebody who's ahead, wor sorry, worked with probably a disproportionately large number of all those new people, um, I can tell you, that during the primary, I remember a lot of us thought it's going to be over by the time we get to vote. And so our big sort of pitch to our volunteers was help out in the early states. Go to them, call them if you can. And we really believed, as it had always happened before, that Virginia's vote wouldn't matter. And so that's why you really got to work hard early. And then it just went on and on. And then all of a sudden, Virginia's vote mattered. And then it mattered beyond that. And that energy level just had to keep staying because you never knew if the next one was going to be the one that finally ended the whole contest. And there, I think there was a certain level of a little bit of tiredness after a while, like, oh my gosh, would this thing just be done? And yet at the same time, also appreciating that, as, as some of you were saying already, that having to build those networks, having to fight in every state, having to work really hard in every state, means that you got all those excited people out there. And so we have, we have experienced volunteers. That's the great thing. People who have already done it once during the primary in every single state. And they're going to come back and bring all the new people who were people who probably were normally like me and just kind of sat on their couch and watched from the sidelines and said, eh, you know, whoever, doesn't really matter. I think a lot more of those people are going to come out. So it did help to make everything stronger. And it certainly did here in Virginia. One of the unique things, first of all, in Virginia, we have elections every year, which is, you don't have that in many states. So we're always involved in politics. We never get a break. <laughs> We've got state elections. we got congressional elections. we got presidential elections. You know, every year we have elections. Uh, we also don't register by party, which means there's a whole bunch of work that we have to do here. Not that it's bad work, because it's, it's voter contact as well, but we have one extra step that we have to do that you don't have to do in a lot of states. But I think one of the interesting things about the Obama campaign is they've fully adopted this 50-state strategy of Howard Dean's, number one. But number two, uh, and Mark Warner is doing it the same way, they're not leaving a stone unturned. They're going to places that are traditionally Republican places, and they are going to work their hearts out. They've got volunteers, they've got interest, and they've got offices in places that, you know, a strategist would never locate a Democratic office generally. They're just not in the same with Mark. They're not, uh, you know, leaving any stone unturned. Uh, we could probably talk about this for another hour, but we're running out of time. So let me thank uh, Keith Lutman. Let me thank Rachel Rifkind, Keith Scarborough, and Bruce Nielsen. I also want to thank Shannon Sullivan. I think the remote was uh, uh, great. And I thank Alex Kohut of Sign of the Whale. Both of us are political operatives, and I'm a former bar owner myself. Uh, good night, and see you next week.